out for them too. It's always a lot of fun uh, being in Chicago. Uh, so yeah, today I'll tell you about this uh, paper that appeared a few weeks ago now. Uh, it's a very fun collaboration with Lorenz Eberhardt, uh, Beatrix Mulman, and Victor Rodriguez. And whatever it's worth, uh, both Beatrix and Victor are on the postdoc job market right now, and they're both fantastic. Um, so let's get started. Uh, this thing is not advancing. So acknowledge the recording. Very good. Okay, so today this is a talk about uh, 2D string theory. So that's the context for the talk. Um, and these models of string theory in low dimension have really been have proven to be very productive laboratories for basic ideas in quantum gravity and in string theory. And the reason is that they seem to retain a very rich physical phenomena, such as holographic duality, non-perturbative effects, things of that nature, despite rem remaining at some, on some level uh, computationally tractable. But on the other hand, the, the world sheet string perturbation theory and the Polyakov formalism, where you integrate CFT correlators over the modulized space of Riemann surface, surfaces, sort of has the effect of often obscuring the underlying simplicity of the physics. And just to sort of highlight this uh, example that's received some recent attention um, are the models of uh, 2D string theory um, known as the C equals one string or the type zero B string. And these admit a much simpler description in terms of uh, large end matrix quantum mechanics. And there's a really nice body of work by uh, Balthazar, Rodriguez, and Yen that sort of uh, clarified the nature of this duality uh, in recent years. And typically, the holographic dual is the simpler and more illuminating description of the theory. And I want to advocate these uh, low dimensional string theories as an opportunity to really derive holographic dualities and try to nail down really physically what's going on in situations where there's a holographic duality. Now, sort of in parallel uh, to these developments in 2D string theory, there's been a surge of interest in another simple model of 2D gravity in recent years. And these are models of two-dimensional dilaton quantum gravity. And the most famous example that you've probably heard a lot about here in recent years is Jakeev Teitelboim uh, gravity and deformations thereof. So this is a simple theory of a 2D metric and a dilaton defined on some surface sigma. And it has this funny, uh, modified Einstein-Hilbert term where the dilaton phi enters linearly. And this is what makes the theory so simple. You can integrate out phi and then basically just focus on uh, hyperbolic surfaces in 2D. Now, this is not just some abstract toy theory, although it is very nice. Um, this, models like this arise universally in the near extreme limit of higher dimensional black holes. And indeed, there's been some progress in recent years in, in using uh, these description of near extremal black holes to facilitate uh, counts of uh, supersymmetric black hole microstates in some cases. Uh, and importantly, as was shown in a paper from a few years ago now by Saad Schenker and Stanford, the, the holographic dual is not a particular quantum system, but rather a statistical ensemble of boundary Hamiltonians. In particular, this model and a large class of models like it are dual to a random matrix integral. Now, of course, uh, it's known, I'm sure, particularly to many people in this room, uh, that there's a long relationship between 2D gravity and uh, random matrix integrals. So these are theories uh, defined by integrating some n by n uh, matrix uh, subject to some potential. Uh, and in the Hermitian case, you can restrict this to some integral over the n eigenvalues. And these models are solvable in the large n limit through a variety of different means. Now, of particular interest to us is this double scaling limit where we take n to infinity and also zoom in near one edge of the eigenvalue distribution. So there's this parameter e to the s naught that becomes a proxy for n that we take to infinity, but there's this still this well-defined density of states that we call row zero near the edge. Uh, and in this double scaling limit, observables admit a genus expansion. So for example, you could look at uh, expectation values of the trace of e to the minus beta h. These admit a genus expansion and powers of e to the minus s naught, where these perturbative uh, higher genus contributions turn out to be entirely fixed by, uh, you could call it z01, or the leading density of states via the loop equations of the matrix integral. Um, so it'd be nice to connect these two sort of, uh, or I guess three uh, sort of lines of thought or approaches to uh, 2D gravity. Um, and indeed, a string theoretic description of JT gravity was proposed around the time of the original Saad Schenker Stanford uh, paper. 
in terms of the world sheet theory of what's called the two comma p minimal string, in the particular in the p to infinity limit where it becomes semi classical. Today, I, I won't have anything new to add to that story. Um, we'll make some comments along the way, but um, instead, what I will describe is a new family of critical string theories in two dimensions and explain that this uh, family of theories is dual to a double scaled matrix integral. And we'll see that JT gravity will emerge as a semi-classical limit uh, to this correspondence. So what I'll tell you about today is this top uh, duality between this, uh, what we call the Virasoro minimal string and a double scaled matrix integral with this uh, leading density of eigenvalues. Now it's parameterized by this uh, parameter B. It's a real number, say between zero and one. And in the limit where we take B to zero, this correspondence precisely reduces to the JT random matrix theory duality. And in particular, this uh, density of states reduces to the famous cinch square root E density of states of uh, JT gravity. So th this theory that I'll tell you about today admits a bunch of equivalent dual descriptions, each of which makes manifest some different facets of the theory. So the first approach that we'll take uh, will be to define the theory as a world sheet CFT and the ordinary uh, Polyakov formalism. And it's defined by coupling uh, Liouville CFT with some central charge to uh, what's known as time-like Liouville CFT. And I'll tell you more about this time-like Liouville CFT and what follows. Uh, arranged so that their central charges add up to 26. We'll see that this theory, it also admits a description in terms of dilaton quantum gravity. It, it's similar to the JT model that I wrote down earlier, but with a particular potential for the dilaton. Now, it, it turns out, um, and this is actually one way that we uh, originally arrived at thinking about this theory, that the observables in this theory are computed as partition functions in a particular chiral sector of 3D gravity. So for example, if you consider the world sheet theory on some surface sigma, um, then the observables, the string diagrams of that theory are computed in terms of uh, partition functions of 3D gravity on sigma times S1. And this is facilitated by a refined understanding of this uh, inner product on the 3D gravity Hilbert space that we worked out in a paper with uh, Lawrence and Mingyang Zhang uh, earlier this year. Now, this is very nice um, because these gravities, or sorry, these observables in this theory have been studied from yet another variety of approaches. Uh, in particular, it's known, um, in particular due to a really beautiful paper of Lawrence from uh, last year, that these uh, partition functions on these kinds of manifolds can be computed by an index theorem. And this opens up a connection to intersection theory on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And that facilitates the technology of topological re recursion, which we then in turn interpret as the loop equations for this matrix integral uh, with this leading density of eigenvalues. And one thing I wanna highlight here is that this uh, cinch cinch formula that I wrote down earlier for the density of eigenvalues is in a precise sense that I'll describe later, the, the Cardi formula for the asymptotic density of states in a 2D CFT. Can you say what you mean by index theorem and intersection? Usually those kind of quantities, those kind of formalisms are needed for, for counting integers. Yeah, that is a subtlety um, that we'll get into. I'll, I'll tell you more, but it, it ultimately comes because you can interpret these partition functions as computing the density of some uh, Hilbert, I'm sorry, not the density, the dimension of some Hilbert space. But indeed, they're not integers. It, this chiral the 3D theory is not fully consistent in its own right. It's more like a chiral sector of 3D gravity. The index theorem counts like the block decomposition of the contour integral. Yeah. Like it's a coefficient of each uh, of each left shred symbol or something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. It, it arises because these gravity partition functions uh, can be interpreted as the dimension of this conformal block Hilbert space. Any other questions while we pause? Okay, so that's these are the, the main different descriptions of the theory. The plan for the remainder of the talk is to go through each of them in turn. So I'll start by describing the world sheet string theory. Um, and then I'll proceed to describe its relation to the gravity on sigma times a circle. That will open up the connection with this Virasoro matrix integral, discuss the topological recursion and so on. And that will lead us to non-perturbative effects in the matrix integral and how they're reproduced on, in the string theory. And we'll conclude with some discussion in future directions. So let's get into the world sheet theory. 
So I, I think it's pretty clear that the simplest description of this Virasoro minimal string is in terms of a particular theory of 2D diloton uh, quantum gravity. So this is very similar to the JT model that I wrote down earlier, except instead of having phi r plus two times phi, we have this more general uh, potential for the diloton. And in particular, this, this diloton potential is given by the cinch, uh, cinch of phi formula. And it's designed so that in the b to zero limit, uh, the cinch linearizes and it just reduces to JT gravity. Uh, and one thing that's worth emphasizing is that this model is not a priori solvable by known techniques. Uh, in particular, it falls outside the class of deformations of JT gravity that have been studied and shown to be equivalent to matrix integrals uh, by uh, Witten and Maxfield and Turiachi in particular. So this is very nice and approachable, um, but we will not any further study this theory in the metric formalism. Uh, instead, it's convenient to consider this field redefinition so here we have the diloton capital phi and rho, which is the vial factor for the metric. And we recast them in terms of these two scalar fields, little phi and chi. Now, at the level of the classical action, what this field redefinition does is it maps the theory to a direct sum of the actions of uh, ordinary Liouville theory and time-like Liouville theory. So for anyone that's um, studied Liouville theory before, you've probably seen this action that defines the theory uh, semi-classically. There's an ordinary uh, kinetic term, there's a linear diloton type term, and there's this potential that grows exponentially. The action for a time like Liouville is similar, but you have this funny wrong sign kinetic term and uh, the, the diloton, or the linear diloton term also takes the opposite sign. Um, now, this is related to the cinch diloton gravity I wrote down when you identify the parameters q and q hat in terms of b and b hat in this way with b equal to b hat. And both of these uh, will turn out to be related to bona fide genuine uh, CFTs with central charges that are related in this way. And when you solve these conditions, then the central charge of the time like Liouville theory is equal to 26 minus that of the space like Liouville theory. How do we? Make sense of the time like Liouville theory with its funny kinetic term and so forth? Like, what do we actually do to the. In practice, we'll resort to the definition of the theory in terms of some solution to the cross equations. I'm not actually going to use the path integral formulation of the theory essentially at all. Which sign of mu TL do you have? Is it de Sitter or anti Uh, Must be anti de Sitter. What happens if you take them independent mu L and mu TL? You can do that, and that will give you some different potential for the. What's your definition of the sitter and under the sitter? So, in terms of solving the equation of motion on high genius, is there a solution or no solution? Um, sorry, could you ask that again? In there are two different ways to define the sitter versus under the sitter. Yeah. Dimensions. Yeah. So do you mean that the classical solution admits the constant negative curvature metric? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I mean. Thanks for the question. Um, good. So th th this is all very nice. And I, the way I want to motivate this is that it just provides some heuristic motivation for us to consider or to take more seriously the world sheet CFT that I'll define by coupling the like non-perturbative CFTs associated with these um, with these theories. So let's get into it. Um, I define the world sheet theory uh, in terms of the following non-perturbative CFTs. By non-perturbative CFT, I just mean solution to the crossing equation, some set of CFT data that solves crossing. So let's take uh, we take C bigger than twenty five Liouville CFT, and we couple it to C hat. That's just what I call the time-like Liouville parameters. I put a hat on everything, uh, less than one uh, Liouville theory, which is sometimes referred to as time-like Liouville CFT for the reason uh, alluded to by this action. And we couple it to the BC ghost as usual. And when C hat is equal to 26 minus C, I wanna argue that this defines a critical world sheet theory, uh, which we may take to be a more precise definition of the theory. Now, when you replace this time-like Liouville, sector with a Virasoro minimal model, uh, in particular, the two comma P minimal models have received a lot of attention in this context. Um, this is what's known as the ordinary uh, minimal string. And I want to emphasize that this is a different theory. 
So let's go through the CFTs, the world sheet CFTs in turn. The first is uh, ordinary Liouville CFT. This is a non-compact, by which I mean it has a continuous spectrum of primary operators, and the identity is not a normalizable state. Um, and it, but it is unitary, um, and it's a bona fide solution to the crossing equations. The central charge is written ter in terms of this B parameter that entered earlier as follows. And when we take B to be between zero and one, the central charge is bigger than 25. The spectrum, so the theory is completely determined at the level of local observables in terms of the CFT data. So there are roughly two pieces to the CFT data. There's the spectrum and there's the dynamics. The spectrum is some continuum of uh, local primary operators. They're scalars, so H equals H bar, with dimensions that are bounded be below by the C minus one over 24 threshold. Now this theory is exactly solved. So we know, we know all the OPE data. In particular, the three point functions of primaries are given by this function that I call CB. It depends on these uh, P parameters. Um, and this is known as the DOZZ formula. And with this together with these two pieces of uh, CFT data, we can compute any local observable by which I mean any correlation function of local operators, um, say N of them on some genus G Riemann surface. For example, by using the conformal plot uh, decomposition. Okay. The P's, the P's are real, I guess. Yes, yes. In the spectrum of the theory, by which I mean the, the set of operators that appears in the, as internal states in the conformal block expansion, the P's are always real. Yeah. But the P's in the correlation function at the bottom, in the minimal string, they're all uh, imaginary. That's right, that's right. That's one important difference between these two theories that I'm allowed to consider purely you real. Theory. You have one theory. The moment there's one theory. At the moment, there is one theory. David was referring I think to. David's question is about the P in the formula for the spectrum. Does it have the same reality as the P in the correlation function? Good. Um, so, is that your question? Uh, no, I was just pointing out that if you want to use this, uh, the formulas on this transparency for the minimal string, not for their thing, yeah, for yeah. the minimal string, you will have to continue the DOZZ formula from real to imaginary PI. For the external case, that, that's, that's exactly right. And one- Now, when you're saying in your case, you will not have to do this. This is one nice thing about this theory is that okay. uh, we, we may take these Ps to be real. From the review. But it is also interesting to consider the analytic continuation to complex Ps. But in your theory? Yeah, yeah, in, my, in this theory. But funny things will happen, right? Because uh, poles make, poles of the integrand may cross the contour uh, in the OPE decomposition. So that can lead to very interesting features. Okay, so I wanna advocate that this time-like Liouville theory is on similar footing to this space-like Liouville theory in the sense that it is a solution to the crossing equations. Now, one important difference is that it's not unitary. The central charge is less than one. So there may be some uh, negative conformal limits. <laughs> but in my view, this is a sort of mild uh, violation of unitarity. But it's been bootstrapped from various points of view in the sense that we know the spectrum and we know the structure constants. So we parameterize the central charge in terms of this B hat guy, similar to B that appeared earlier. And this is less than one when we take to B hat to be between zero and one. Now, just like ordinary Liouville CFT, the spectrum um, is some continuum of primary operators. They're all scalars. And their dimensions are bounded below, again, by the C hat minus one over 24 threshold. The OPE data, similarly to space-like Louisville theory, are also known. So the three-point functions of primaries are given by this C hat object. And a kind of remarkable fact is that if you use a suitably convenient basis of operator normalizations, this C hat is precisely equal to the inverse of the analytic continuation of ordinary DOZZ formula. And that will play a role in what follows. Another nice feature of these uh, of, of observables in this theory compared to um, those in space like Liouville CFT is that they actually define uh, quantities that depend analytically on the external p hats. So I was mentioning earlier in response to a question that um, for ordinary Liouville CFT, if you complexify the p's, and funny things can happen where the poles may cross the contour and the OPE decomposition. That actually doesn't happen for a time like Louisville CFT. It's not the 
analytic structure of this thing is just such that uh, poles don't cross the OPE contour. Now that there is a price to pay and that I've, I've slightly lied to you about what the spectrum is. Uh, you have to shift the contour slightly because the conformal blocks and the structure constants have poles on the real P hat axis. Um, but subject to that shift of the OPE contour, you can show that the observables still solve the crossing equations. So these P hats will be imaginary, don't you? For now, we will. So the internal P hats are always real. I mean, but the external P hats, you may take them, for example, to be imaginary. I mean, uh, just to, like if you just have time, right? E to the i omega t, yeah. and the dimension is minus a half right. omega squared. Yes. Whatever. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the, in the application of interest, the external P hats will be imaginary. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So th that's the world sheet CFT. Mm -hmm. Let's construct some observables in the string theory. Now, I've mentioned a few times that the case of interest, we uh, solve to cancel the vial anomaly, we arrange it so that the central charge is added to 26. And what this means is that this B hat parameter that I wrote down earlier is actually equal to B. Now, if we consider some observable with external states, we also have to solve the mesh shell condition, which means the external conformal weights have to add up to one. And that means arranging it exactly so that these p hat variables are equal to i times the p variables of the ordinary movable CFT. So indeed, in the application of interest, uh, the p hats will be purely imaginary. And so we can define on-shell vertex operators uh, by coupling some primary in the Liouville CFT with a corresponding primary in time-like Liouville CFT, just with imaginary uh, p hat. So just to correlate with things I know. Yep. If I replace your time like the, the minimum model with the same value of C hat, I guess, your value of P that you would put here would not be the one that appears there. Yeah, exactly. So by an I. In that situation, the P's that I would have to, so you would have VP from ordinary Liouville CFT times some primary in the minimal model. Right, but the P will have an extra I exactly. relative to what you have, but then the, the V hat will also have an extra I or not. A question. Well, the V hat is a prime, some primary in the. Um, but its dimension is such that it's outside the range of. It requires analytic continuation of the ordinary Liouville CFT. Yeah, exactly. No, not Liouville, minimal model. I'm trying to compare you. Uh, no, no, sorry. The, the minimal models are more rigid objects. Right. So I have to pick some primary that's in the spectrum. But the, P, the P's that you take in your time like Liouville, do they correspond to operators in terms of the dimension? E that or do they differ by an I? I think they'd have to differ by an I. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, these, these things are going to be delta function normalizable, and the ones you're familiar with are non normalizable, right? Yeah. In the well, phi. at this theory, I don't even know. No, in, in phi. No, phi, I, I made my peace with it, but <laughs> it's the other one. Yeah. Like, no, no, but I'm that. saying that the difference between them. That he's considering things no, that, that phi are delta function normalizable. Yeah, no, that, that I understand. They're, they're non normalizable. That's right. That's just the statement that the piece are in this situation. Okay, so as usual in string theory, we compute observables, string diagrams, and string perturbation theory by integrating these CFT correlators and the two sectors over the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. So you can construct these observables that we call VGN by integrating the endpoint functions of uh, primaries in Liouville CFT times the corresponding primaries in time like Liouville CFT on some Riemann surface, um, say with genus G. And we couple it to the BC coast in the usual way to define the integration over the moduli space. Now these observables actually have some very nice properties. Um, so we refer to these for reasons that will become clear later as quantum volumes. Um, and what, what's really nice about these observables is that they're actually absolutely convergent integrals over the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And this is not ordinarily the situation in string theory. Usually there are divergences and you have to analytically continue or regularize in some way. Uh, here, these things just converge, which is nice because it means you can in principle put them on a computer. So I'm, I'm confused. If we look at the three point function, yeah. I'm remembering your earlier slide, they were just inverses of one another. Yeah. So. Do the product of those just cancel to some? Well, in, in 
for at the level of the three point function, I'm about to describe the three point function. Actually, that's true. But for like a four point function, they're integrated over different variables, so that they don't they don't just trivially cancel out. And, and we'll see that these string diagrams or quantum volumes are actually uh, we'll see that they actually are simple polynomials in these external momenta, which is obviously not clear at all from this presentation of the theory. Yeah, and I guess the fact that these are polynomials sort of drives home that they really don't behave. They don't have the analytic properties that we expect of some S matrix elements of some conventional uh, 2D target space theory. So the, the, the simplest example you can consider is this three-point function, V03. So in this case, there's no moduli space integral to do. You just have the product of three-point functions. And exactly when you arrange it so that you cancel the vial anomaly and solve the mass shell condition, then indeed they cancel out. And the three-point function is just equal to one. So now it's at least in principle straightforward, uh, if you know difficult and like uh, computationally tedious, uh, to evaluate directly the in these integrals of the world sheet CFT correlators over the moduli space. Um, the simplest examples that you can consider are the sphere four point function and the torus one point function. This, in these cases, the moduli space is one complex dimensional. And what you find are these like ridiculously simple answers uh, for the quantum volumes. You know, they're just these quadratic polynomials in the external momenta in the case of the four point function, and just this constant plus p one squared in the case of the torus one point function. And th this is really it's kind of absurd. And like, remember where these things originated from, right? Like we are integrating CFT correlation functions, which themselves involved integrated DOZZ formulas and conformal blocks. Like these are all very complicated objects and the integral conspires to produce these extremely simple um, polynomials. Uh, there's something stupid I don't understand with this formula yeah. already in Rodriguez. Um, if you set, if you set the first formula, no, the, 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 the right, on the right slide, if P4 is zero, this thing is supposed to reduce to d by d nu L of the three-point function. Uh, not, not zero, right? And you have to set it to be imaginary. Uh, so I, I apologize. So that the weight is some one. Value, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so why does this formula not have that property? I mean, from your previous slides, it should, right? From the first slide. Well, from um, in terms of, of the classical action and so on. Well, like you wrote an action. Yeah. I mean, and if you take d by d mu l of the any path integral, I mean, of course, you took a mu tl to be equal to minus yeah, mu l. That's right. But I could uh, say let's decouple them first because uh, you know that to compute derivatives, you can you, you don't have to actually decouple them, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. You just treat them as separate, yes, yes. take d by d mu l, and then at the end of the calculation, set them to be equal and opposite. Uh -huh. So my question is, why is this thing not behaving in the right? Because in the, the, the Louisville theory that uh, Nati and I remember from the old days, yeah, yeah, yeah. it does happen, right? That, uh, you know. <laughs> when you have one, set one of the conformal weights to one. It doesn't have that property. Yeah, you don't. This, this is not. So look, if you go to the previous uh, slide, can you go back? Uh, you, you, I don't remember which slide it was, but uh, yeah. So, uh, okay, so remember this and then go to the next one there. Or, or wherever the operator they're defined. No, you have a definition of these Vs, right? Okay, so in this formula, so what, what are you saying that? I'm saying when that, you go to that value, the, the, the corresponding DOCZ formula. And... No, no, I'm not asking about uh, such complicated things. <laughs> My question is the operator. So if you set um, P to, well, some, you can do one of two some things, imaginary right? Value, yeah. So there is some value of P for which the part of this operator in the first factor is the identity. Or you can do the uh, another value. I mean, it's a question. Yeah, I'm not uh, obviously. Yeah. The, so th there are two values of p that is defined by that formula. For one of them, you have an identity in the Louisville, and for the other, you have an identity. You have the marginal operator. And what I'm saying is that I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, if I look at the three-point function and do exactly what you say, yes, I don't get the three-point function for time-like. Well, first, so that's more complicated because, as you know. 
uh, in the full string theory, the token function is complicated with it. You know, the zero. I'm just talking about some statement about a conformal full theory. Okay, so uh, but, not, but I, what, I, I don't understand. So what does that mean? There, there are some special things like the, the you wrote an action in mu. Yeah, I, I thought it meant the time like blue theory is pathological, but maybe not. There are, in other words, uh, that's a polite uh, Midwestern way of saying that it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no, I, I, there are. That's not what they're saying. Right, I know. There are some special things that happen when you set the external weights to be zero or yes. one, which is the case you're referring yes, to. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a bit complicated to explain in person, but it, well, you can I, morally think of it as a mu derivative. If you take the one where you say take um, space like Louisville to weight one and then subtract the one where you said space like Leovold to be weight zero, then it's related to a lower point string diagram. Okay, let's talk we about can, it. We can discuss after. I don't think there's I'm any. Not, I'm not going to this part. The case that he's asking about is not in the range of P's. That that's right. That's true. That's true. So you, you can't even put this formula, because this formula, as he defines it, makes sense only when the P's are not, you cannot, not in the, so it requires an analytic continuum. like to take up the taking the derivative, is not in the range. Of okay, the so can, can we go to the four point function? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what you're saying is that this function, where is it? This function, yeah. despite the fact it's, it's that it's a stupid quadratic polynomial in P, it cannot be continued to the whole concept plane. That's basically what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, thing is only valid when P is. That's what you I think, choose. That's what you claim. <laughs> Okay, look, uh, you, you can analytically continue these things, and there are um, special things that happen for this external. I don't think you can have the way. But what he wants to do is to analytically continue separately the P and the P hat. You set them to be equal. But no, we want it. Okay, look, let's talk let's, about Let's discuss that. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I don't want to, I want to get to the end. It's okay. Um, all right, so these are these extremely simple numerical, or extremely simple formulas for the quantum volumes. Um, and just one thing to emphasize is that if you take the B to zero limit and scale the P's appropriately, these exactly become the Val Peterson volumes of the corresponding surfaces. And that will be a more general compound. So here's some numerical evidence with some very small error. Um, Victor is a real pro at uh, computing these kinds of things directly. Uh, so here's the sphere four point function as a function of uh, one of the external weights for some values of the central charge. And here's the same thing for the torus one point function. The, the agreement is, uh, is very strong. Now, of course, in the full theory of quantum gravity, we should sum over topologies. Um, so um, we sum over genera weighted by this e to the minus s naught factor. Now, this sum is asymptotic, but we will be able to make sense of it by a resurgence. And I'll have to stay on that later. Uh, in view of time, uh, let me go very briefly over this slide. Um, the main upshot is that we can also equip the world sheet CFT with bound conformal boundary conditions. And these facilitate studying this string theory on, surf on surfaces that have asymptotic boundaries, asymptotic ADS2 boundaries and also to study non-perturbative effects in the string theory via these fields and um, And in constructing, one thing I want to adver advertise here is that in constructing the conformal boundary conditions, both for the asymptotic boundaries and for the ZZ instantons, you sort of by accident uh, stumbled upon a natural family of conformal boundary conditions for a time like Leopold CFT. And we refer to those as half ZZ for some technical reasons. But they're, they're morally as easy like boundary conditions in the sense that they're localized rather than extended. Okay, so um, I've said a lot about the world sheet theory so far. Let's discuss um, the relationship between 3D gravity. The way I think of it is that 3D gravity sort of forms the connective tissue between the world sheet presentation of the theory and the matrix integral presentation of the theory. And technically, the connection is via this uh, Virasoro TQFT that Lorenz uh, Mignon and I uh, studied earlier this spring. So in, in, in that paper, we discussed the Hilbert space of 3D gravity in terms of the quantization of the phase space, which is the type Miller's, two copies of the type Miller space on sigma, some surface sigma, which is like an initial value surface quantization. So the Hilbert space of the gravity theory involves two copies of this TQFT Hilbert space, which we argued is given by the space of Virasoro conformal blocks on sigma. 
Now, uh, the Hilbert space is more than a vector space. You also need an inner product. And uh, the main thing that led us to this theory in the first place is that there's an inner product on this conformal block Hilbert space, which involves integrating the conformal blocks over a Teichmuller space. And it's tantalizingly similar, like almost identical to the world sheet moduli integrals that appear in this uh, string theory. So this inner product is computed by um, taking two conformal blocks. These are functions on moduli space. So to get a number, you integrate them over moduli over Teichmuller space. And you weight them by an auxiliary time likely of those CFT and the BC goes to cancel the bile anomaly and to solve the mass shell condition, basically so that this integration is well-defined. And we argued that this inner product is in fact orthogonal, um, so that it's equal to a delta function that sets these internal weights P and P prime, uh, sorry, there shouldn't be a P prime on this one, uh, to be identical um, up to some overall density, which we argued was given by the OP density of the corresponding observable and Liouville CFT on the surface sigma. So this involves some product of DOZZ formulas. And so the, the upshot is that, so now we're considering a single copy of the TQFT. So the relationship with 3D gravity is more with a chiral half of 3D gravity. So if you then consider the partition function on sigma times S1, then it is. it turns out that the, the partition function is literally equal to the quantum volumes. So this partition function on sigma times S1 is given by, it, formally it's by it's given by the dimension of this conformal block Hilbert space uh, divided by the mapping class group. And the way we compute that dimension is by taking the trace of the identity in this conformal block Hilbert space. And so if you, if you work it out, you resolve the identity in this conformal block Hilbert space in this way, you take the trace, you integrate over Teichmuller space, and this integral exactly prepares the ordinary space like Louisville CFT correlator. Now, the only difference is that it's integrated over all of Teichmuller space rather than moduli space. And the effect of gauging by the mapping class group is to re reduce the integral over Teichmuller space to one over moduli space. And then that exactly gives you these quantum volumes that we computed. So this may be rather fast, but the upshot is that by taking this TQFT formulation of the theory seriously, the chiral gravity partition function on sigma times S1 is equal to these quantum volumes that we compute on the world sheet. And this is useful because in a really beautiful paper from last year, Lawrence gave another, another way to compute these chiral gravity partition functions. Um, he argued that they can be computed directly by an index theorem. And the reason is that this gravity partition function uh, computes the dimension of the Hilbert space that you define directly by quantizing this phase space. So you gauge out by the mapping class group first and then quantize. So it's basically amounts to the quantization of this uh, moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And if you unpack, if you unpack that index theorem, it gives you the, this following uh, cohomological co integral over the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. It involves these uh, funny cohomology classes, kappa and psi. It doesn't matter exactly what they are, but the point is it gives this expression for these gravity partition functions. And to compute this integral, you simply expand the exponential and pick out the top form. And so what that means is that these quantum volumes ultimately can be computed via the well-developed technology of intersection theory on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And so although this discussion may sound somewhat formal, I want to emphasize that this presentation actually reveals some really uh, interesting features of the quantum volumes, which are otherwise obs uh, completely obscured by the presentation in terms of a world sheet moduli integral. In particular, uh, from this uh, intersection theory point of view, we learned that the, qu the quantum volumes are just polynomials in the momenta PI, which sort of reifies what we saw earlier by direct computation. And the reason is that you can compute them by just expanding out this exponential and picking out the top form. So they have to be polynomials in the p-squareds of degree 3g minus 3 plus n, which is the di complex dimension of the uh, moduli space. Even more intriguingly, we learned that they satisfy this very funny duality symmetry that you can at least morally think of as swapping the role of space-like and time-like Liouville on the world sheet. So if you take C to 26 minus C and P to IP, then the quantum volumes are preserved up to a sign, which you get from this explicit formula. This sounds intuitive that the two world sheet CFTs should be on 
you know, some democratic footing. And it seems reasonable, but I, you can't even really properly formulate this on the world sheet because this time like Louisville CFT only uh, exists as a solution to crossing for C less than one. Is there so, a positivity condition for this volumes or? There, there is, there is. Uh, not, it's not obvious, but it follows from this presentation. Does it put conditions on this coefficients you have? Uh, because intersection is specifying K1, Psi, and Kappa. Yeah. Um, or is it all I, I, no, the way I would say it is that you learn about some positivity properties from this presentation of the theory. And I, I don't think it puts any constraints. I mean, other than C is bigger than 25. So. Any other questions? Okay. Now, maybe a more down-to-earth ap application of this relation with 3D gravity is that it also teaches us what the partition function on the disk and on the trumpet is. So the disk partition function, well, this is given by the 3D gravity partition function on the disk times a circle, which is just the solid torus. And that, of course, is nothing but the Virasoro vacuum character. But it's the Virasoro vacuum character in the dual channel, because here we're fixing the the length of this uh, of this disk, and then when you think of that as disk times circle, this is the length of the spatial circle, not the thermal circle. So the thermal circle is like the modular S image of this beta. Similarly, uh, the trumpet partition function, which is punctured disk times a circle, is just given by this ordinary non-degenerate Virasoro character in the dual channel, which you can also uh, compute from 3D gravity. Uh, and here the contributions of the descendants via these eta functions uh, are stripped off because uh, in a second, we're gonna relate this to some matrix integral and the matrix integral is a random theory and could only even in principle capture the statistics of the primaries because the descendants are completely fixed by symmetry. And now that we have these uh, disk and trumpet partition functions, we can consider exactly as in JT gravity observables that have asymptotic, uh, asymptotically ADS2 boundaries, simply by gluing trumpets onto these quantum volumes. So we compute something like this, uh, this quantum volume here with these finite boundaries, P1 and P2. And then uh, we add asymptotic boundaries by gluing these trumpet partition functions on. <clears throat> and there's a non-trivial measure that appears in this gluing procedure, which you can actually also argue for from uh, 3D gravity, but I won't get into it here. So that's the story from the 3D gravity point of view. I realize it was probably a little fast. Are there any questions before I move on to the matrix integral? Okay, good. Now the matrix integral, via the loop equations is of course, at least perturbatively fully fixed by its leading density of eigenvalues. So here, uh, one way to interpret the fact that the disk partition function is the vacuum Virasoro character is that it fixes the, dense, mm -hmm. the leading density of eigenvalues in the matrix integral to be this cinch cinch formula, which is again, the Cardi formula for the asymptotic density of states in 2D CFT. More precisely, it's the, the modular S matrix that takes you from the identity character in one channel to a complete basis of characters in the dual channel. And as, as a, one matrix integral. Yes. But I, I'm confused. The, there are two dimensions in the bulk theory. Usually that corresponds to like one dimension in the boundary theory, like a matrix quantum mechanics versus. Right, the, right. That, how right. did you get down to zero from two? It's. I don't know how to argue for it for, for, from first principles, but it, it's computed, it's equivalent to a single matrix. Uh, I mean, it's a similar situation in the two comma P minimal, minimal string now. Well, two comma P, you have a finite number of matrices. Yeah. That's so a, in the end, there is one dimension. Right, right. But it, it's specifically because of the fact that the minimal model that is not like it. it right. But when you go to C equal one coupled to- Yes, the, then, then you- uh, the, uh, One, space which is the eigenvalues in one time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, the bulk theory mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and here you seem to have something similar yeah but you only have one matrix you think that's right Same. yeah i mean to be fair we do not have a very good understanding of the target space mm -hmm. the special case of c equals 25 was studied by victor 
and he proposed some interpretation in terms of uh, 2D string cosmology. No, but there there is time. Yeah, yeah. In other words, there. But also, they don't understand the matrix quantum mechanics. In that case. Okay, but it's it's some story in matrix yeah. quantum mechanics. There well, is. A... I, mean, I guess the thing that I should say is that this is 2D dilaton gravity on the world sheet. It's not in the target space. It's equivalent to this dilaton theory at the level of the world sheet quantum gravity. Well, I, I was just referring to one of your early slides that the world sheet theory has, a, I forget how to call them, a phi and a phi and, high, yeah. and both of them are non-compact. Yeah, yeah. And so, well, okay, I mean, that, that, that's how things are. Yeah, yeah. You know. I, I don't have an a priori answer for that. Okay, so as, as, but the theory has an S matrix. No. We don't really know uh, what the target space theory is. I mean, naively, if I'm just looking at the world sheet description you started with, in the space-like direction, I have waves running into yep. an exponential wall yep. reflecting back at it. I have the same thing in the in time, time direction. That's right. Um, but in time, they cannot reflect. Like in the Rodriguez story that we had the seminar about last year. Yeah. Yep. So you, it's a one plus one dimensional. There is a wall either in the past or the future, depending on yep. Yep. which sign you give to this yep. reveal. And let's say if it's in the future, so you can send things from the past, but these are the only observables according to him, right? Yeah. Like the uh, waves that come in, and you can calculate amplitudes. So it's not an estimate. It's not, yeah. It, it, I think they're not like the wave function of the exactly. They're components of the wave function of the anyway, universe. Whichever words you attach to them, the calculation is you have things coming from uh, null past infinity. They hit this wall at defining time, and what happens? But so, okay, but, but there's but there's a continuum of oh, them. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, so certainly in Rodriguez there is a continuum of them, right? And yeah. uh, that is the signal of the fact that there is a phi and a t. Yes. The phi, which is you know. I would think that there's a similar interpretation to this more general theory away from C equals twenty five. Okay, but uh, this formula doesn't know about it. You think? And again, it's the world sheet theory that's equivalent to this, uh, uh, not the space-time theory of strings propagating in target space. Well, you're saying that this world sheet theory does not have a space-time? <laughs> Pulchinski would object. <laughs> I mean, the textbook. Yeah. I, don't yeah, mean I know. I know. I know. Just give it first. Okay. Um, so that's the density of states. That completely fixes the theory by uh, the loop equations. And the main observables in this theory, as usual, and matrix integrals are resolvents. So trace of one over E minus H. And of course, these uh, can be computed in the genus expansion. Uh, and these resolvents are simply related to partition, the partition functions that I discussed earlier by Laplace transform. And these partition functions are in turn related to the quantum volumes by gluing trumpets. So there's this uh, triangle of equivalent observables. The partition functions on the one hand, you get them from the quantum volumes by gluing trumpets. And those are related to the resolvents by in the Laplace transform. These all capture the same information. Now, uh, because this is a double scaled matrix integral, um, the genus expansion is of any observable, but in particular, uh, the resolvents is uh, completely determined by this leading density of states. Um, and uh, so we have this topological recursion for the resolvents, and we can translate this into a topological recursion for the quantum volumes themselves. And we can think of this as a deformation of Miriam Mirzakhani's uh, recursion relations for the volumes and volumes in a, in a pretty precise sense. So the way this topological recursion works is you take the quantum volume and you pick one of the external, uh, say, geodesic boundaries of the surface, and you sum over the different ways of embedding a a pair of pants essentially that involves that uh, geodesic boundary into the surface. So there are uh, embeddings like this where you reduce the genus by one but increase the number of external legs by one. There are uh, these ones where you sort of divide the surface in two and have to split up the genera, sum over different ways of splitting up the genera. And there are finally these ones where you share um, a geodesic boundary with another leg of the pair of pants. And that preserves the genus by reducing the number of external legs by one. And you see here, the only thing that depends on B, like on the details of the theory, of, is this recursion kernel, H, which uh, when you take B to zero, reduces to uh, Mirzakhani's uh, recursion kernel. 
So that perturbatively completely solves the theory. It, you can, it leads to a very efficient uh, algorithm to compute these quantum volumes in, in terms just of the leading density of states. So I'll conclude by discussing some non-perturbative effects in the theory. Now, for C bigger than 25 or B not equal to 1, this matrix integral is non-perturbatively unstable. Uh, and the reason for that is that non-perturbatively eigenvalues can tunnel to this classically forbidden region, uh, E less than 0. Uh, and this is captured by this uh, non-perturbative contribution to the density of states, uh, which is uh, exponentially small and involves this uh, effective potential, which is uh, computed entirely in terms of the uh, the leading density of states of the matrix in the goal. So in order to define, even in principle, a non-perturbative completion of this theory, we have to modify the integration contour in the matrix in the goal. And of course, this is an ambiguous process, and any given choice will require including some non-perturbative corrections in gravity. And these correspond to ZZ instantons. Question? Uh, yep. So if I remember correctly, uh, the two comma P, this issue arises only for P, for some P's, but not others. Ah, uh, there are only non-perturbative effects for- No, there are non-perturbative effects in all of them, but it's stable for half of them. Oh, I see, I see. Not stable for the other half. This is Borel Samuel versus not Borel Samuel. No, there's nothing to do with that. Oh. It's just whether the matrix potential is bounded. Oh, oh, okay. oh, I see, that's interesting. Here, it's only in the case B equals one that it's stable. In a special case where it grows forever, uh, often negative B. So, for example, the, the Li Yang singularity, yeah. which is two five. Example, sorry, two five. Two, two, two five. five. Two five. That's stable. Huh. But this has nothing to do with it. I know. I, I'm. I'm very curious about the relation between the two. The yes. Two yeah. Me too. Um, that's interesting. I hadn't appreciated that actually. Um, yeah. So th th this is some very different. Uh, well. I guess one thing you can say is like one benefit of this theory compared to the minimal string is that it depends smoothly on all of the parameters. Um, so is this a pro or a con? In my view, it's a pro, but reasonable people can disagree. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I guess it's not totally surprising to me that this distinction between stable and unstable only occurs at like the extreme of the uh, the value, the allowed values of B, but it is surprising that there's such a stark difference with the minimal string. I didn't appreciate that. Good. Okay, and so we can compute the single instanton corrections to the quantum volumes, um, and these are these come from the extrema of this effective potential we have, and there are two infinite families of these, which I label by a positive integer and a sign. So the, the way to compute their, uh, the contribution of these single instanton effects to the, uh, to the quantum volumes, this corresponds to having one eigenvalue localized in this forbidden region, is what we do is we deform the integration contour to pass through one of the new stream-up. And then we apply the subtle point approximation, and this gives this infinite family of non-perturbative corrections to the quantum volumes, which again are labeled by a positive integer k and a sign. The things to notice here is that it's imaginary and it involves e to the minus t, where t should be interpreted as the tension of the corresponding zz instanton in the string theory. So what, what, what these non-perturbative effects signal is that this perturbative series that defines the sum over quantum volumes is asymptotic. And in fact, we can use resurgence techniques to predict the large g asymptotics of the quantum volumes directly. And so these are the uh, large G asymptotics that you would infer from this uh, resurgence calculation. The things to highlight here are the this gamma function, which uh, signals a 2G factorial growth and the large G uh, behavior of the quantum volumes. There's this uh, tension to the 2 minus 2G minus N, which we interpret as a renormalization of the string coupling from E to the minus S naught to 1 over T. And there's this funny p-dependence, which involves cinches. And what's interesting is that the large g asymptotics of the quantum volumes are highly non-polynomial in p, which seems surprising. And uh, to wrap up, uh, the, the main thing I, I want to tell you is that these non-perturbative effects in the matrix integral 
these correspond precisely to ZZ instantons and the minimal string world sheet. And these come from uh, particular conformal boundary conditions uh, for the world sheet CFT, where we put ordinary ZZ boundaries on the space like Louisville and this new family of novel conformal boundary conditions that, that we called half ZZ on the time like Louisville. And the upshot is that this, these leading non perturbative contributions to the quantum volumes that I uh, wrote down here, you can precisely uh, re reproduce these corrections by um, the following world sheet diagrams. So at this level in perturbation theory, you just need to care about uh, the disk and the annulus. And uh, you have uh, the punctured disks for each of the external uh, Louisville momenta. And all of these disks should be viewed as having these uh, ZZ instanton boundary conditions. Um, now, this is subtle and there are ambiguities. And in fact, treating the annulus diagram uh, correctly uh, requires string field theory. And that leads to some ambiguities. And in fact, they're the exact same ambiguities that I referred to uh, earlier uh, about the non perturbative conclusion. So that's it. Uh, let's wrap up. Uh, so what I've told you about today is a critical string theory in two dimensions that's defined by coupling space-like to time-like Louisville CFT on the world sheet. And it appears to be a completely distinct and in some senses simpler theory than the two comma P minimal string say. Um, so this theory, you can think of it from a bunch of different points of view. One of them is in terms of this 2D dilaton quantum gravity with the cinch potential for the dilaton. From that point of view, it's clear that it reduces to JT gravity in this semi-classical C to infinity limit. And the main observables of the theory from the string theory point of view are these quantum volumes, which we compute as absolutely convergent integrals of these CFT correlation functions over moduli space. Now, the main point of this work was to argue that this string theory is equivalent to a double scaled random matrix integral. And the leading density of that matrix integral is this Cardi density of states in 2D CFT. Uh, and from the, from the matrix integral, the technique of topological recursion gives an extremely efficient algorithm to compute all of these uh, quantum volumes. And finally, I tried to argue that this whole setup can be understood as arising from the particular uh, dimensional reduction of a chiral sector of 3D quantum gravity. Um, there are some loose ends in future directions. Let me just leave, in view of time, let me just leave these on the screen and say thanks a lot for your time. Thank you for the talk. I apologize for, for asking so many questions. No, I thank still, you. I still have tons of them. Right. So let's start easy. <laughs> this is some metric semicolon that you need. Yeah. And then you take a limit. Yeah. The same is true yeah. also for the two comma yep. p. Yep. So whatever your theory is, of course, it corresponds to some point in the space of two comma p. I think it's different because two, from the point of view of JT gravity, the two comma p model is in the defect regime. In the sense that the this is what David was mentioning earlier that the p's are imaginary. No, so what do you mean by a point in two comma p? No, I'm I'm doing matrix model. Yeah, right? Point in central charge. You know? Forget all that. I'm doing the, the matrix. Yeah, just purely model. from the matrix. You do the matrix model side. And there are some parameters in the potential, and for every one okay. of the parameters, there's I get something. Yeah, yeah. But the two comma p's are not the same. Well, P well, is the... everything is called P here. <laughs> no, I know what you mean by P, but, but you mean like the form? Yeah, no, uh, the P deformed by whatever you want yeah, to yeah. Add the, like the lower powers of the matrix, these kinds of things. I thought, add whatever you, you write a potential for the matrix. But the yeah. Tukuma, yeah, the Tukuma P is just M, M for some power. And yeah, even that is not accurate, but <laughs> you're writing my question. Okay. The, the, it has to.